Last week, I was in Cameroon chasing Boko Haram along the border with Nigeria. Like most of you, I would imagine that what you know about Boko Haram is primarily about the Chibok girls who were, were kidnapped and we don't know what's happened to them. That was mostly what I knew, although I had done a little reading. And as I was doing my reading before I went to Cameroon, I learned how much uh, Boko Haram has affected the neighboring countries as well and that there are incursions over the border all the time. And we were with the um, Cameroonian special forces who are trained by the Israelis and they're very well equipped and I found them very impressive. And we went up on the border to a place where there had been an incursion by Boko Haram about 24 hours previously and two Cameroonian soldiers had been killed. And it was really interesting. I spoke to one of those who'd been injured. He'd had a bullet through the, like, through the right arm. And he told me how Boko Haram, that they're just across the border, their base is about, the Cameroonian base is about 400 meters from the border, and that Boko Haram had left a, a bullet in an envelope just outside the base a few weeks previously, and that they creep around at night and flash torches and try and intimidate the Cameroonian soldiers. And I found all that very fascinating because it reminded me, actually, I thought about you know, the bush war in, in Rhodesia, Zimbabwe back in the 1970s. Those are the kind of tactics which the guerrillas used. And that made me begin to think about Boko Haram as a, as a guerrilla force like you found many in, uh, in Africa, for good or, or evil, not just as how we see them as jihadis attached to uh, the Islamic State. And then uh, we went to a village and the people in the village were from the Kanuri tribe. And the Kanuri tribe, which straddles the border, most of the fighters for Boko Haram are Kanuri. Now, you may have known that before. I didn't know that before. So suddenly we're in a village where people are pulled both ways because some of their sons have joined Boko Haram. And yet they're also scared of Boko Haram. Boko Haram had attacked um, some weeks previously and they had burnt 30 houses, all the houses of people who would not cooperate with them. And one of the Cameroonian soldiers said to me, if someone is your brother or your sister, you will not deny them, even if he or she is the devil. And so then I began to understand some of the dynamics of the conflict in that area along the border. And I thought, this is why I do what I do. This is why I'm, I'm a journalist who always wants to go somewhere and find out something new, something I didn't know before. Because there are journalists, very ideological journalists, who it's what I call paint-by-numbers journalism, who, who know what they think. They know what's right and they know what's wrong. And to be honest, I think I was a bit like that when I was in my 20s. And now I find that every time I spend three hours traveling down a rutted road to get somewhere weird and different and far away, I learn something that I didn't know that changes how I look at things. And that's the whole point. That's the whole point of being a reporter, of being an eyewitness. And we had half a day when we didn't really do anything very much in Marua, which is the um, capital of the far north of uh, Cameroon, because the embed hadn't worked and the colonel was being an arse and all of that kind of stuff. And so we did what you would always do. We went to the races. <laughs> I said, what are we going to do in Marua? We've got all afternoon. And they said, oh, you know, there's a horse race going on. I said, brilliant, let's go to the races. So off we went to the races, and it was fantastic. And it... And what you had, it was rather sandy, as you can imagine. It's a bit deserty out there. And all the horses, quite thin horses, but still good. And um, all the jockeys were quite young boys. And some of them had full silks and some of them didn't. And all the uh, dignitaries were in the grandstand, including the uh, deputy prime minister, whose wife had been kidnapped by Boko Haram last year and then returned, probably after the paying of a ransom. And then all the little kids sitting on the ground in front. And... So one minute you're talking to a wounded soldier about bullets and envelopes, and the next minute you're in amongst people who are yelling, come on, number six. And that's also why to do it, because I learned something from that too. I learned how people are trying to get back to normal in that part of Cameroon, which has been very badly affected by Boko Haram. They want to get back to their normal lives. And you know, probably not that different really from the crowd at Aintree. They're still interested in the same stuff. <laughs> And so that teaches you about common humanity and all of that. And it's also about, you know, why, why do I and other people like me do this stuff? It's partly the witness to history thing. You want to be where th things are happening. And I want to see things with my own eyes. That's the point. Just see it for myself. Experience it. 
And people often ask, you know, how dangerous is it? Isn't it very dangerous? And yes, of course, there are times when it's dangerous. I don't think that trip was particularly dangerous because the Cameroonian Special Forces were not going to let three foreigners be kidnapped by Boko Haram. We had, I think there were five jeep loads of very well-trained soldiers with us. And on the trip to the village, there were two armored personnel carriers as well. They were not taking any chances. But yes, of course, on other occasions, it is dangerous. And I think that as you grow older, you get to know your own danger threshold, what you can do and what you can't do, what your own limits are. I went to Syria quite a few times last year. I was in Aleppo in November. In fact, I did get injured in Aleppo. I tore a ligament in my right knee. And the, the official story is that I was under fire and I, I saved a child. Um, <laughs> actually, there's this shop quite near the front line where they sell very good spices, including za'atar, which is one of my favorite spices. Anyway, I was climbing the steps. I don't quite know how this happened, but my knee gave way underneath me and I fell down the stairs. And I really did do myself quite a bad injury. So I did go to the heart of the Syrian war zone and come back with a shopping injury. <laughs> Having said that, of course, it is serious. I've lost a few friends. I've lost one of my best friends, Marie Colvin, who was killed in Homs in 2012. That was after she and I had been in Beirut together. And there'd been three of us having dinner Jim Muir of the BBC, Neil McFarker of the New York Times, myself and Marie. And the three of us said we wouldn't go into Homs. It was beyond our danger threshold. And Marie did it. And Marie did it because she was braver and better and different from the rest of us. And I think about her a lot, of course. And people sometimes ask me, well, is it much more dangerous for a woman? Well, the mortar that killed Marie killed a young male French journalist called Remy Oshlik, as well a photographer. It didn't discriminate on gender. And on the whole, I don't think it's more dangerous for women. Now, people say, what about, you know, sexual assault and so on? Yes, of course, there's a danger of sexual assault. But I've never seen any research which shows me that um, female foreign correspondents or war correspondents are at greater danger than female firefighters or police or soldiers or, or any other comparable uh, kind of profession. And actually, as a woman, I think we have a great advantage, particularly in the Middle East, because we're treated, um, Marie used to call us the third sex. You know, you're, you're treated in a way which is different from women of the, of the country. And so you're treated like a man. And I've never not got an interview with a head of state or a general or whatever because I'm a, I'm a woman. But it is quite often different for male, difficult for male correspondents to interview women. They can't always get to the women because the women are quite often in the kitchen or behind or whatever. Whereas we as women can get to them. So it often means that the male correspondents are only getting 50% of the story. They can't get the women's perspective. Whereas we can get both the men's perspective and the women's perspective. So I see it as an advantage. So it means that, it means that men can't do the job as well as women, but I don't think that means that they shouldn't be allowed to do it because I think it would be, I think it would be wrong to discriminate. People sometimes ask me how I started. I started because I was going to change the world. That was one of the projects that hasn't really worked out because um, I knew what was right. That's another project, because these days I find myself finding it more and more difficult to know what's right. And um, I became an aid worker. I was a volunteer with Oxfam in Central America. I got the... Uh, I mean, nobody's ever been employed by Oxfam like this before or since, I think. But anyway, basically, I wrote to them and said I wanted to, to come and be a volunteer. And they wrote back and said, can you type and can you do accounting and can you pay for your own airfare? And I went out and bought, and I wrote back and said, yes, yes, yes. And then I went out and bought teach yourself typing, teach yourself accounting, and went to work as a waitress until I had the airfare and turned up and was completely useless because, of course, I couldn't type or do accounting. So they sent me off to visit projects and talk to people. And I suppose that was when I realized I was going to end up as a journalist because that I could do and that I really loved. And... I did that for a while, and then I went to, um, to Kenya, to Africa, to work for the UN Children's Fund as, um, as an information officer, which was a fantastic introduction. I traveled around Africa, and I wrote mainly for The Guardian under a, a pseudonym. 
And then I realized I really wanted to be a journalist. And so I left and went freelance and was a freelance um, in Africa for several years before coming back here and getting a job with the BBC. And it was great to work for the BBC, to work for the World Service, World Service Radio. But they didn't... I guess they just didn't think I was that good, really. And so I kept applying for correspondence jobs and not getting them. So eventually I just gave up and I left and I went freelance again. And I had no money and I had no career and all of that stuff. And so I had to take a position with UNICEF again in Rwanda, which is how come I happened to be in Rwanda when the genocide started in April 1994. It's sometimes hard to talk about this because I got there in February and then it, have, it started on April the 7th. I was the only English-speaking foreign correspondent who was there. It was a complete accident of fate. And um, it was very difficult and terrifying. And in the first few days, there was a soldier just outside where I lived who would direct me to go back in, and so I didn't go out. And I mean, everybody knows about genocide, but there was a war going on as well. There was lots of firing and shelling, and I didn't really know what was going on. I was on the phone to different people. I was on the phone to people I knew from UNICEF who were all weeping and asking me to come and rescue them because they were about to be slaughtered. And I couldn't rescue them. I couldn't save them. All I could do was write down what they said and broadcast it for anybody who would ring and write it for anybody who would take my stories. And on the fourth day, Philippe Gaillard, who was the International Committee of the Red Cross representative, rang me and said, you've got to come and come out with us. And, you know, it's the silliest things, you know. So I said, fine. And... Well, I was terrified that I was going to run out of petrol, finding my way to the Red Cross office, and I was terrified that I would get lost because I have no sense of direction. I don't know where I'm going. I'm really rubbish like that. And it wasn't very far away, but I was just sure I was going to go the wrong way. And I had to drive through the roadblocks with the men with the red eyes and the empty beer bottles and the machetes and the bodies at the side. And I got to the Red Cross and um, committed a war crime, actually, because I put a Red Cross jacket on to go around, because they said to me, you have to see, we have to have a witness to what's going on, and you are it. So I put on the Red Cross jacket, and I went around. And I saw some terrible things, and I won't tell you all of them. But I don't, I don't forget them. I don't forget them. And in the hospital, uh, I actually did see the gutters running with blood. It's not the kind of thing you ever think you're actually going to see for real, gutters running with blood, but I did. And the trucks coming in with the bodies. And I don't think my reporting was particularly good, I think it was okay, but I didn't understand what was going on. And now when people look back on the genocide in Rwanda, it's obvious, of course, it was a genocide. You know, when you're in it, you can't really always know that. And I look back now and I feel terrible about my reporting. I think it was pretty weak because it took me such a long time. And I suppose that's one of the other things that you learn as a journalist, that you don't always get it right. I've been lucky since then. I have this job with Channel 4 News and I have covered a lot of conflicts and I have worked in China where I didn't cover conflict. I, I covered things which, you know, are, are the better things. I, covered, I did a story about violins. You know, did you know, there are 10 million Chinese children learning to play the violin now and 30 million learning to play the piano. That's what I call progress and development and change in a positive way. And I think it's very important as journalists that one should look at that as well as all the other stuff, as well as all the, the war and pain that we cover. And in the end, I think you know, people say, you know, I struggle a lot. Is it worth it? Is, I mean, of course, it's worth it for me because I love what I do. Does it make a difference? I don't know if it makes a difference. Sometimes you can alert people to a situation, a humanitarian situation, and that's important. I don't expect to be able to influence policy. I don't always know what policy is. Should we intervene? Should we not intervene? I don't always know. But what I do know is that it's always important that there should be people on the ground, journalists, who see what's happening and who listen to the Kanuri villagers, not just to the army, who actually listen to ordinary people on the ground, to the peasant woman as well as the president. I think it's really important that we listen to those people and we report what they say. And then whatever happens, nobody can ever say that they didn't know because we told them. Thank you.